As the desert sands of the Sahara blow gently by, Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi sits in his palace, contemplating his next move. A messenger arrives to update him on the war on his southern border, and the news is not good. Ragtag gangs of enemy soldiers in Toyota pickup trucks are on Libyan soil and wreaking havoc. The origins of this conflict can be traced to this eccentric Libyan strongman who, after seizing power in 1969, sought to expand his sphere of influence across North Africa. Meanwhile, the newly independent Republic of Chad had been plagued by civil war since 1965, and its founding president, Francois Tambalbe, struggled to hang on to power, seeking to mitigate a potential threat and settle a historical dispute. Tambalbe agreed to the sale of a strip of land at the northern border, based in the oasis town of Auzu to Gaddafi's Libya. This Auzu strip, which was rumored to have valuable uranium deposits, would serve as a catalyst for not just Tambabe's overthrow in 1975, but the war to come. Throughout the late 70s and early 80s, Chad would suffer through a web of competing militias and shifting power dynamics. The presidency of Chad would also change hands multiple times, before being consolidated under Hussein Habre in 1982. Habre was a notoriously ambitious and brutal leader, known for his public displays of violence and power. An account from rebel forces recalls searching his home only to find the bodies of 50 opponents right outside. A commission report released by subsequent Chadian governments said that Habre was an opportunistic and ruthless figure, responsible for numerous human rights violations, political killings, and systematic torture. By 1982, Gaddafi was deeply entangled with the Chadian civil war, and had consistently supported efforts against Habre through backing various rebel groups and, occasionally, direct military intervention. But now that Habre had consolidated power, it was time for Gaddafi to begin a new offensive. Libyan soldiers, equipped with modern Soviet weaponry, quickly took hold of most of northern Chad. However, their advance was halted by a French expeditionary force, compelling Gaddafi to agree to a demarcation line at the 15th parallel. Habre's power was ensured, but his country was now partitioned. Gaddafi, content with these developments, took to building military infrastructure and sending reinforcements to the occupied territories under the guise of support for a rebel government. However, when significant elements in that rebel group began to defect, Gaddafi's cover was blown, prompting him to cross the 15th parallel. This led to a second French intervention, now spearheaded by the French Air Force, in support of Habre's government, and resulted in the bombing of Libya's airbase at Wadi Doum in February 1986. France was now all in on supporting Habre and retaking all of northern Chad. Researching and organizing the information I find on the web for our videos can be a huge challenge, especially when working on multiple projects at once. And that's why I'm pleased to recommend the sponsor of today's video, Opera, a web browser that's faster, safer, and smarter than your default browsers, and fully featured for privacy, security, and everything you do online. I've been using Opera for the last few months, and it's made my internet surfing a lot easier and more productive by incorporating a dynamic interface and functionality that adapts to my browsing, providing more space, faster navigation, and smoother interaction. Navigating through dozens of open tabs with no easy way to categorize them was inefficient and time-consuming, but Opera's tab islands offered a simple way to keep my browsing sessions separate without overwhelming me with tabs, making it easy to quickly identify the information I need to create with videos like this. I can browse with separate, dedicated tab islands, collapse or expand islands in one click to hide content and make space, and switch between islands. Another Opera feature that I like is Aria, a free AI which explains, explores, or translates any text you highlight on a page. A handy tool if you need to skim a page for information quickly. 
Opera also comes with a built-in ad blocker and VPN, ensuring you a safe, secure, and private web browsing experience. Support our channel today by clicking the link in the description below, download Opera for free, and begin experiencing the most efficient, dynamic, and intuitive web browser available. By 1987, Chadian and Libyan forces numbered in the thousands. But Gaddafi had the more modern equipment, including hundreds of tanks, dozens of fixed-wing and rotor aviation, and several rocket artillery batteries. Habre was hopelessly outmatched, but his allies in France promised both air support and, unusually, a shipment of 400 civilian manufactured Toyota pickup trucks, specifically made up of the Helix and Land Cruiser utility models each to be armed with heavy machine guns, rocket-propelled grenades, and anti-tank guided missiles. While the procurement of these civilian vehicles, or technicals as they would later be known, may seem like an odd decision, there were a number of factors that gave the Toyotas a decisive advantage against standard armor. For one, the top speed of a civilian pickup was unmatched compared to military hardware a Helix could easily outpace the 31 mile per hour max speed of a T-55 tank. This speed is complemented by a naturally better fuel economy, as a single gallon serves a civilian vehicle much farther than the 1.6 miles for a T-55. This makes the logistics of war much easier, as far less fuel needs to be sent on supply lines for a far more efficient result. Finally, the cost and skill level required for repair is unusually low for the Helix and Land Cruiser. Proper maintenance on a modern main battle tank, or APC, can take weeks or months of dedicated training from highly specialized personnel. But a civilian mechanic with a modest amount of experience can easily get a Toyota back on the road, or in this case, the battlefield. The Toyota War began in earnest on January 2nd, 1987, when 1,200 Libyan troops and 400 Chadian rebels were taken by complete surprise in the strategically crucial northern city of Fada, when 3,000 Toyota-bound Chadian troops descended upon their position. A majority of the Libyans were routed, and the materiel damage that occurred was even more surprising. 92 tanks and 33 infantry fighting vehicles were destroyed, with dozens more vehicles captured, all to the tune of 18 Chadian dead and three technicals destroyed. In a desperate attempt to prevent the capture of his vital equipment, the Libyan Air Force sent bombers to the newly captured city on January 3rd and 4th. But these attempts were futile, and only served to further justify French attrition by air against the Libyans. The loss of Libyan air superiority opened up a window of opportunity for the Chadians. Commander-in-Chief Hassan Jamos determined that Libyan forces would need to be more effectively thinned out before they could be driven out of the country. Defenses at Fada were made intentionally weaker so as to bait the Libyans into attempting to retake the city while the French sought to keep the skies clear of Gaddafi's air force by keeping pressure on the air base at Wadi Doum. This trap, laid by Jamos, was sprung on the evening of March 18th, when a force of 1,500 Libyans and dozens of tanks making the long trek to Fada were surrounded by a convoy of roving technicals. Encircled and miles away from the nearest village of Bir Kora, Libyan tanks surrounded their camps in a defensive perimeter, but the stationary units could barely get their sights on such mobile targets. In the ensuing chaos, Libyan forces were able to ask for reinforcements, who, in the dead of night, left the base at Wadi Doum. Meanwhile, in order to break Libyan defenses, Chadian forces began a diversionary attack with the intent of swinging around the rear of their lines. In doing so, the Libyan forces collapsed long before help could arrive. By the time these reinforcements were well out of sight of their base, they too were encircled and destroyed on the 20th. Over the course of two days, 800 Libyan troops were killed, along with 86 tanks destroyed and another 13 captured. Chad certainly wishlisted our upcoming strategy game Master of Command on Steam, linked below, to pull off such a decisive victory.
The Battle of Bir Kora demonstrated not only the massive advantage that speed played in modern desert warfare, but also the innovation of Chadian officers. It seemed as though they could not fail, and that the Toyota was the new king of the battlefield. However, as the Chadian forces continued their sweep, a rift began between their French allies over the Auzu Strip. Habre was committing to uniting his country, including the town of Auzu. But since the territory was legally transferred by purchase, and because they did not want to risk starting a larger conflict, France refused to extend its air support to operations beyond the internationally recognized boundaries. From here on, this would be a war the Chadians would fight alone. Chadian technicals crossed the boundary into the Auzu Strip in late July and quickly began occupying Libyan outposts. A force of around 3,000 Libyans began to regroup in the Tibesti Mountains, just south of the town of Auzu proper. As these forces exited their stronghold for an attempted counteroffensive, they were intercepted at the town of Bardet and were forced to retreat. The Chadians then chased these forces all the way to Auzu itself inflicting hundreds of casualties and capturing more than a hundred more vehicles along the way. Auzu was then captured on August 8th. The swift capture of the Auzu Strip was met with rage from Gaddafi, who considered this a slight against his legitimate claim on the territory. Gaddafi mobilized the largest single force in the conflict yet, 15,000 troops to retake the town. Libyan artillery bombarded Auzu for days, and starting on the 14th, attempted to take the town with multiple assaults, but all were repelled. With confidence in the security of Auzu, Chadian forces began to withdraw from the town to prepare for their next attack, leaving a skeleton force of 400 troops as a garrison. As the bombardment continued, however, the Libyans deployed a unit from the Revolutionary Guard Corps which made a decisive impact on the Auzu garrison. And with French air support not forthcoming, the Libyans retook Auzu on August 28th in their first and thus far only victory in the war. Despite this setback, Chadian forces had proven themselves capable of military operations without the French, and so Habre sought to push their capabilities as far as they could go, in a decisive battle that would force Gaddafi to negotiate, or at the very least, give up on his dreams of imposing a greater Libya upon Chad. The forces under Habre had already utilized many of the most fundamental pillars of military strategy, but were prepared to employ another. That being that the best defense is a good offense, Habre was going to take the Toyotas to Libya itself. As night fell upon the isolated Matin al Sera airbase on September 5th, 2,000 Chadians crossed the border into Libya. About 100 tanks and other ground vehicles guarded the nearly 30 fixed-wing aircraft stationed at the base, along with more than 2,500 personnel flanked on all sides by a dense minefield. All of this manpower and materiel was in a metaphorical island in the Libyan Sahara, about 60 miles north of the Auzu Strip. Channeling the British Jeep raid on Sidi Hanish airfield 45 years prior, the Chadians raced down the airstrip, firing missiles into the stationary aircraft, causing irreparable damage to essential hardware and disappearing as quickly as they arrived. Accounts differ on the details, but it was reported that if the Toyotas drove over them at a certain speed, around 62 miles per hour, the anti-tank mines would fail to detonate in time to catch a technical, either going off a few seconds late or not at all. Libyan defenses were rendered completely useless. The Matan al Sera airbase was rendered unusable at the end of the night raid. Its equipment captured, its infrastructure destroyed, the airstrip torn up and its personnel dead, captured, or fleeing to the cold sands of the Sahara. At least 1,000 Libyan fatalities were tallied, while the Chadians suffered just 65. In this moment, the war and the greater cause to exploit a divided Chad was lost. Seeing the drastic reversal of fortune, the Libyan dictator swallowed his pride and called for a ceasefire. In total, over 7,500 Libyans lost their lives in this eight-month conflict, compared to 1,000 Chadian fatalities. It was an embarrassing defeat for Gaddafi, 
who had now been driven out of all of Northern Chad's territory, and who lost all influence over its internal politics. After the ceasefire, the dictator recognized Habre as Chadian president as his gift to Africa. However, they still held control over the Auzu Strip, an essential symbol of Libya's military prowess. This too, they would have to concede in 1994, not militarily, but by diplomatic pressure, when the International Court of Justice ruled that it was Chad that had rightful claim over the Auzu Strip, and that the Libyans would move out of the land a couple months later.